Hello and welcome to the sixth and final session of our Positive Strategies Behaviour course. This is for all parents of children and young people with additional needs. I hope that you found the previous sessions useful in helping you to understand the wide range of needs which may be affecting your child or young person or filling up the bucket and the ways in which these needs will impact on their behaviour. I hope that you will feel more confident about producing plans for managing routine situations and that you'll be happy to share those plans with others so that your child is getting a thought through and consistent approach. I've also been sharing with you strategies about communicating better with your child, about how to minimise the impact of sensory input, and I've explained how structure and routine will create a calmer life for all the family. But even when you're doing all of these things, there will be times when the bucket is full to overflowing and you will have to deal with a meltdown. In previous sessions, we have spoken about the need to observe calm behaviour so that you can replicate it and challenging behaviour so that you can begin to identify triggers and see patterns and formulate strategies. It will come as no surprise then that you also need to look at meltdowns in the same way. Not easy when you're in the middle of dealing with one. Maybe your partner can be dealing with the child while you are observing or vice versa. So the bucket has overflowed. What does that look like? Some will melt down inwardly, just completely zone out, stare into space, not respond to you, or perhaps just repeat a particular body movement. Others will start running, crying, screaming, lashing out, stamping feet, swearing, maybe even growling. It would be very good if these kind of things only happened at home, but they can often happen when you're out and about because you're in a less controlled environment. So in a crowded place, your child or young person may be getting bumped into a lot by other people, which they may very well find upsetting. If you're traveling, the noise of a plane or a train approaching a platform could just make them want to run away very fast. Not a good idea. Think about whether they wanted to be alone or whether they wanted you nearby. By observing these kind of things, you may see patterns which will be helpful for your planning in the future. And learn some lessons from what you or your partner actually did to react to the situation. Did you have something with you that helped? Did you try something which just in fact made things worse? Did they respond when you said certain things but not respond to others at all? All useful information to start gathering. It might be useful at this stage to just have a look at the differences between an average everyday tantrum and a meltdown in a child or young person with an additional need like ASD. What they do both have in common is that they can happen at home or in a busy supermarket, but let's look at some of the differences. So, a tantrum usually requires an audience because that is kind of the whole point of the thing. But a meltdown can occur with or without an audience. A tantrum can result from a build-up of frustration, but equally it can just be a planned technique to get exactly what you want and which is being denied to you. A meltdown, on the other hand, is really an involuntary reaction to being overwhelmed in some way. Tantrums very often can stop and start 
while the um, child or young person is checking whether it's having the desired effect you sometimes see that they're sneaking a little peek to see whether they're winning or not but once in full flow a meltdown is self-feeding and becomes a storm which just needs to blow itself out and even giving them the thing that you think they want may not be able to stop it. A proper meltdown is exhausting and there's just this feeling that they do need to release some tension. This last point about needing to release some tension ties in with what parents have told us about feeling as if their children will almost goad them into confrontations which will result in a meltdown as if they really need this and they know that they will feel calmer afterwards. So remember the bucket model. The bucket filling up with frustrations and worries and disappointments and lights and sounds and smells. We've been talking mainly so far about proactive strategies to maintain calm behaviour. But when the bucket does overflow, we need to be much more reactive. Be aware that the bucket may overflow as a result of one thing happening which the child just cannot cope with. I worked with a family whose daughter was a bit problematic at home but usually fairly angelic in school and one day to the surprise and horror of the school staff she suddenly ran from the classroom, climbed a playground wall and ran straight across a busy road without looking to get to her house. And it turned out that this was because a classmate had seen a spider and screamed pretty loudly right behind her and without thinking about her safety or how much trouble she would be in she just ran that noise made her run so the meltdown can be pretty instantaneous like that but for others it can be a slow build up a child or young person who's been feeling misunderstood or badly treated at school may only need one more drop in the bucket, one more unkind word for that bucket to overflow. When the bucket is beginning to overflow, don't try to reason with the child. They are usually beyond reason. And don't downplay the issue because it's clearly a huge issue to them. And don't get angry with them as it will only make the situation worse. Instead of thinking, I must do something, try to think, I must do no harm. It doesn't mean that you can't still try to distract and divert them. Do something ridiculous to make them laugh. Dance or sing or make faces. They may hate it, but it's worth a try. Or sit close to them and just start reading from a book that you know is one of their favourites. See how long it takes for them to slide across so that they can see the pictures. If your child considers themselves to be an expert on mini beasts, for example, start talking about that or say something like, I saw a spider today, it was red and it had six legs. The hope is that they will feel compelled to start a conversation about arachnids and the fact that they have eight legs. Ignoring is a useful tool. Sometimes you may choose to ignore behaviour and this is a useful strategy for those behaviours which are designed to shock or to get a reaction and swearing is the most obvious of those behaviours. It's not always easy to ignore, particularly if your child is swearing in the back garden and you're worried about the neighbours on the other side of the fence, or if they're doing it in the school playground and other parents are looking at you in horror. 
but sometimes it can be a very useful strategy because sometimes your reaction is what is reinforcing the behaviour. But we absolutely realise that it is very, very hard to do. And sometimes you maybe feel strong enough to do it and other times you won't. But try to be consistent. Remember what we said about doing no harm. Is it safe to ignore them? Is your, is your child trying to actually communicate a need? Um, will they feel unloved or unlovable if you're ignoring them? Should you think about saying something like, Mummy loves you, but I am not staying in the room with you when you're behaving like this. Come and find me when you've calmed down. Discuss as a family what you will try to ignore and then be consistent and markedly return your attention when the behaviour stops. Help them to make the link between calm behaviour and your attention. So don't start giving them your attention half an hour or an hour after the meltdown has stopped or the challenging behaviour has stopped. Try to jump in straight away with a positive comment and give them some attention, help them to make that link between their good behaviour and your attention. I'm sure most of you have heard of de-escalation scripts. These are routinely used in business settings for dealing with angry customers and they follow similar patterns. We recognise that the person is upset that they feel there's a problem and we tell them that we want to help them but that they need to calm down so that this can happen. So an example of that would be, I can hear you're upset, you clearly have a problem with how our organisation has dealt with you, I would like to help you to get this sorted out but I will need you to calm down so that I can clearly get all the facts I need in order to achieve a resolution. Can you hear the parallels? A child or young person in crisis needs to hear the same messages but just in a more caring and loving way. So scripts can be agreed between partners for lots of behaviours before you even get to the meltdown stage. They help you to feel prepared for situations. You feel less stressed because you know what you're going to say. An example would be the statement that we just used in the section about ignoring. I love you, but I'm not staying in the room with you when you're behaving like this. Come and find me when you've calmed down. Make sure that if you agree some scripts that you're going to use, that you pass them on to grandparents older siblings, babysitters, anybody who may be in a position that they need to deal with a similar situation. Consistency, consistency. And since we're talking about consistency, let me just reiterate that you probably have a child who is resistant to change because they have already become very attached to the routines that they already have, even if those routines are not really working for them and not working for you as a family. So perseverance will be required. It takes time and effort to change behaviour. It will take time for you to change your behaviour and then it will certainly take time for your child to change their behaviour. And it may get worse before it gets better, but keep going. It will be worth it. Giving a child space to calm means different things to different children. A lot of children with additional needs will really benefit from having a safe space in which to calm. It can be in their bedroom or a tent or teepee in a corner downstairs or just a pile of cushions behind the sofa in the sitting room. Make sure that they know they're not that being sent here is not the same as being punished. 
many will be happy to go to this place and calm in their own time and quite happily do it on their own. To other children, being sent to a fairly secluded place might say, you're not loved when you're having a meltdown and they'll want to stay close by or they may actually need to be touching you. Work out what is best for your child to help them to calm. Space is also important when the meltdown is over. After a meltdown, your child or young person will need to cool down, repair, reflect and restore. How will they do this? They need to relax and recover. A meltdown is exhausting. Older children can be taught some breathing exercises or they could learn to listen to music which calms them. Younger children may just fall asleep or need cuddles from you or they may have a favourite toy which calms them or they may like to be near to their pet. A lot benefit from lying on a trampoline and feeling the gentle movement. They will need comfort and reassurance. This might mean cuddles or it might mean giving them their own space entirely. Some will take comfort in a weighted lap pad or blanket or from handling sensory toys. Stimming such as rocking or humming or repeating phrases can be used. If the meltdown was about a change in routine, for example, if you had to take a different route to school because of roadworks, then assure them that you will be able to get back to them at the end of the day, at the normal time, and that this change will not change the routine for the rest of the day. Give them the information which will make them feel safe again. Time and space, as we've said, are different for everybody. It can be quiet time in the room or you may want to put things in there like paper to rip up or to scrunch into balls and throw across the room or pillows to punch or scream into. Try to provide them with alternatives to breaking toys or trashing the rooms. Space might mean bouncing on a trampoline or digging in the garden or walking the dog round the block if they're old enough to do that. And reflection is important. It is important to learn lessons from this, to reflect on what happened, but don't attempt to do this immediately. The emotions may be so close to the surface that you trigger another meltdown, but it is still really useful to ask questions at some stage. Don't punish a child for a meltdown. They really are not in control and it can be a very lonely and scary place for them. So to sum up, here are some golden rules about meltdowns. Ensure their safety and the safety of others. Give them time if you can. Stay as calm as possible. Try to give them space, but if you do need to approach them, do it very gently and use very simple commands. Too much talking will not be comprehended at this stage. Put all your focus on the child and ignore bystanders if you can or ask them quietly to move on. If it's something which happens regularly, then it may be worthwhile preparing a meltdown first aid kit. What you have in there will depend on the situation that you're going into and what you know about your own child but it could include things like sunglasses, ear defenders, chew buddies, a favourite cuddly toy and so on. And be sensitive as they come out of a meltdown. Older children in particular will, will be hugely embarrassed that it has happened in a public place. 
And as we've already said, don't talk about the meltdown there and then um, because the emotions may be too close to the surface and you could trigger another meltdown. But do approach them about it sometime later, the same day or the next day. Remember that there are other people in the family. Siblings can be adversely affected by having a brother or sister with additional needs. They may feel with some justification that the other child gets all of your attention or that they miss out on things because the favourite wouldn't like it. Brothers and sisters of children or young people with additional needs are classed as young carers whether they do any caring or not. Think about a young carers group, there are still some out there and do let your school know if this is the situation. Brothers and sisters shouldn't be punished for being late regularly because their sibling has a meltdown in the morning when they're trying to get out to school. The school should be aware that you just do not always have the time to support them with homework or schoolwork and they can then make the necessary adjustments to put some extra support in place for them or some extra time for homework at school. And look after yourselves. Try to do something every day which is just for you so that you're making holes in your own bucket. I know that's easier to say than to do. Accept help. If a friend says, I would be happy to take your child to the park once a week, then let them. You don't have to be a superhero. Let people help you. And reach out to organisations that can give you some help or support. It's not a weakness, it's a sign of strength that you know that you need a bit of help. Talk to friends, but talk to friends who you know will not be judgmental. Be open and honest with them. A problem shared really can be a problem halved in some situations. And as you probably blame yourselves for some of your child's worst behaviours, make sure that you also praise yourself for all the positive things about them. And there are always lots of positive things. You must then also be responsible for the fact that they are often loving and caring or creative and artistic. You are good parents, so keep up the good work. I will finish by showing you some contact details for Family Actions, Norfolk and Waveney, ASD and ADHD support service. Contact us just for a chat and a bit of advice, but also to book yourself onto a course, a workshop, to join us for a coffee at a drop-in support session. Learning online does not replace the benefits of meeting other families who've walked in your shoes and who can support you and share experiences with you. And note that you can now find us on Facebook also as Norfolk and Waveney ASD ADHD Support Service. And finally, when you close this video, please click on the link to complete our online customer service questionnaire. Help us to improve the service that we provide to you. I hope that you've enjoyed all the sessions of the course that you have watched and that you would recommend it to a family member or a friend. And thank you for joining me. Goodbye.